Okay, I think we better get started so we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Uh, my name is Rebecca Welsenbach. I'm the Journals Coordinator at Michigan Publishing, which is part of the University of Michigan Library. And I'm here with my colleague, Jason Coleman. Hi, I'm Jason Coleman. I'm Director of Michigan Publishing Services. So the title of our talk today is Scaling Up, Recovering Costs to Enable Mission-Driven Library Publishing. Um, it's really a talk about the efforts over many years at Michigan Publishing to understand what it costs us to provide publishing services both on our campus and to external partners. And then to use that information to develop a scalable, sustainable, but still affordable program of publishing services. Um, and above all, our most recent challenge, a program that complies with all the absurdly complex requirements at a large nonprofit public institution like the University of Michigan. Um, so there are really two truths sort of underlying what we're trying to do here, and maybe one lie if you've ever played that game. Uh, truth number one, we have some funding, some backing from our university, but we're kind of at capacity for what we can do with it and for how much we can keep asking for. So if we want to keep growing and doing more, we need to find more money from more places. Truth number two, um, there is money, often in departments and units on our campus, and often they really want to give it to us to do work for them. Um, but what we did not have um, is an appropriate way to ask for it and receive it from them to make that transaction happen um, smoothly and legally. And the lie is, boy, that sounds easy and logical and mutually beneficial for everyone. <laughs> um, that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, so sort of plan for the session. Um, we're going to be going through basically our quest to act on these two truths, um, that we need to find some more money, that it's there, and we just kind of need a way to, to get it. Um, I'm going to start by walking through what we have done in the past, um, some of the things we've tried that have worked or not, and then I'm going to pass it over to Jason to get into the details of how we're doing this now, what we're actually trying to make happen this year. And finally, we'll sort of step back and raise some points and questions that we hope might be of use to you if you're thinking about charging fees for services at your own institution. Um, really, this session could be called Misadventures in Cost Recovery. Um, it's sort of a peek into this black hole that we've fallen into as we try to answer this question that our dean and others have posed to us over the years, which is just simply, why don't you charge for this wonderful thing that you're doing? Um, and as we'll see, the answer is because it can be really hard to do it. Um, so just to clarify as we get started, Michigan Publishing is the primary hub for scholarly publishing at the University of Michigan, and our organization today is sort of broken into three major parts. The University of Michigan Press, um, our institutional repository, Deep Blue, and Michigan Publishing Services. The press is sort of the traditional part of the operation. It's funded primarily through sales of print monographs and ebooks, and Deep Blue, the IR, is funded by our library. So we're not going to be talking much about either one of those today. Um, what we are going to be focusing on is this middle one, Michigan Publishing Services. Um, this program, established within the last year, includes our long-running journals program, print-on-demand projects, and other service-based publishing projects, uh, mainly open access monographs and web-based projects. It is supported neither entirely by sales nor by our library, um, so it sort of falls somewhere in the middle. And how we fill in that middle space is exactly what we're going to be talking about. Um, so, as I just said, Michigan Publishing Services, as such, is less than a year old, um, but in fact we've been doing this kind of service-based, um, mission-driven publishing at U of M for many, many years, um, more than 15. And our approaches to recovering costs and generating revenue have changed over the years as our organization has grown and as our leadership and mission and goals have changed. Um, so I want to take you through some of the things we've tried as they all have, you know, come together to bring us to where we are today. Um, in the early days, our office was called the Scholarly Publishing Office, and at that time, we provided free hosting and journal publication to journals that would agree to sort of, on their part, make their content available for free. We were trying to win over people to give open access a shot. Um, we did this for journals based on our campus and also elsewhere. Um, and in addition to OA resources, we hosted subscription journals and some other subscription resources. And the sort of basic model there was that we would receive 15% of the revenues that these generated, um, creating this sort of balancing act of stuff that we did for free and that was freely available um, offset by some of these other projects that generated some money. Um, I put up our two subscription journals, Feminist Studies and the Journal of Anthropological Research, although really they've never generated more than a couple thousand dollars a year. Um, when you're talking about salaries of full-time people, it's, it's like a drop in the bucket. Um, a big one that we're not talking about today, but it's important to acknowledge as a source of revenue is the ACLS Humanities eBook Project. Um, we're the host for that resource, and that actually has offset a lot of our work over the years. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. 
So at this stage, for basically the first 10 years of SPO, um, any revenue that we brought in was generated by sales on the end of the customer, um, either through subscription sales or book sales, but we were not charging publishing partners for any upfront costs or services. Um, this was in line with our goals at that time, which were to generate resources beyond the funding we had from the library, um, to subsidize open access projects, projects with revenue generating projects, and um, this sort of dream that we could get people to try open access by giving them free services to do it, um, which, I mean, they did. It, it worked well, really well. Um, we continued to grow, however, and acquire more projects, and many of them were journals that came to us precisely because they already wanted to do open access. We didn't have to sort of seduce them. Um, and it became quite common for us to have all these projects that were sort of in between development and launch. Um, sometimes we would put a lot of work into something and then it would just disappear before we ever launched it. Other times we'd have something in development for many, many years and then um, we'd sort of, you know, put it on the margins and then the editor would pop back up and be ready to go and we'd have to find the capacity to help them. We didn't have a good way of ensuring that our publishing partners were committed to completing their projects in a timely manner. Um, so to combat this, we took sort of our next step in trying to recover costs and generate revenue. Um, and this happened around 2009 uh, through 2011. We started to experiment with charging setup fees for new partners. The first time we did this was with a journal called Philosophy and Theory and Biology. This is an external journal. Um, the editor is based at Minnesota and CUNY. Um, and the first time we did this, we thought of it as a rush fee. Um, so they gave us $2,000 and we promised to get the journal up and running in 90 days, um, which is much faster than three years, which some journals take. Um, this $2,000, it's worth noting, was kind of arbitrary, um, but it was meant to reflect about the staff time and effort that we thought went into launching a journal. Um, frankly, at this point, we were kind of guessing, um, but later exercises to track the time and gather data proved that it was a pretty um, accurate guess. It was a, a, decent, a decent number to use. Um, for a couple of years, this $2,000 setup fee sort of became our rule of thumb for external journals. Um, at this time, we were not charging any U of M journals a startup fee, so we did this did this for a while. Um, an important thing is that we also were not charging any ongoing hosting, preservation, conversion fees, and that's really where most of our time and effort um, were going, is in maintaining all of the 25 plus, 30 plus journals that we already had up and running. So we were not really recovering our costs here. There was a lot of staff time and effort going to work that we weren't being paid for. Um, but our goal at this moment was to create a sense of value for our work and commitment on the part of our publishing partners. We wanted them to prove to us that they were sort of in. Um, it really wasn't until around 2012 that we began to seriously investigate what it actually costs us to do this kind of work, the conversion of journal articles, um, the setting up the first instance of a new journal. Um, so for a number of months, our digital publishing coordinator tracked her time spent on this, and then Jason and I both did sort of different things with it. Um, but one important piece that came out of it was that we used this information to develop a template that is now part of our acquisitions process. So when we get a new journal proposal, um, in addition to evaluating the proposal for sort of the quality of the journal and do their goals align with ours, we're also looking at um, what are the costs involved here? Is it just very standard baseline? Is there some extra work needed, custom web development, anything like that? Um, so this is now part of the discussion we have before we even agree to take on the journal. Um, Let's see, again, we were doing this mainly for external journals, um, although we would still kind of waive the fee if we could make a compelling reason to do so, like this journal sounds really great, but they just don't have any money. Can't we please help them anyway? Um, we still did that. We also started to get some pushback um, from our interim director that we ought to be charging the setup fee for all of our journals, not just our external ones. And this was a kind of an important turning point for us as we thought about how do we actually charge our internal partners. So where did this actually leave us? Um, we're now more than a decade and hundreds of spreadsheets into trying to figure out our costs and how to charge back for them. Um, so are we rolling in dough? Um, we were not. In 2013, for example, uh, we established partnerships with five new journals. Um, of these, one of them paid the setup fee, one of them paid a discounted setup fee, three of them had the fee waived, um, either they were U of M partners or they were able to make a case for, for why we should do that. Um, so all of this effort led to $3,000 in journal revenue that year. Um, and again, still nothing from the existing 30 plus journals that we had on board. So we've kind of done all this work. We're hoping to work toward um, offsetting the salaries of full-time people, and we just hadn't quite gotten there yet. Oh, this is our cost estimate template. I forgot to pull that up. So we sort of break down what happens as we're taking on a new journal, um, setting up the new collection in our system, um, all the different parts and pieces, and come up with a, a number that we think it will equal. 
So anyway, we need to be more ambitious in doing this if we're going to actually recover sort of real costs of the, the people working on these projects. But how do we get there? Um, there are a number of strategies that we've tried and abandoned or that we're still sort of wrangling with to figure out how they might work. Um, so we talked a little bit about subsidizing OA with revenue generating products. I think this is sort of always part of the mix. You know, maybe you have someone who's paid for by a project, but that person actually works on more than one thing. Um, but it is important to us to figure out a way that OA can sort of stand on its own, not only be an extra that's funded by other things. Um, so we really want to kind of ask more of ourselves and of our program um, so that OA projects can, don't need to be tied to other revenue generating products. Um, another approach is the tier-based fee structure, um, where maybe there's a very free sort of baseline level of service, um, something that costs a little bit more for extra services, and then a sort of full bells and whistles kind of thing. This is um, a, a pretty common way to approach this kind of problem, a way to offer something for free, but also then recover some costs. For us, where we are right now with our um, sort of homegrown platform, it's really difficult to do this because so much of the service is kind of packaged into the product. It's actually really difficult for us to back out and say, here's your baseline that doesn't take any effort on our part and that leaves you totally responsible. Um, I think this is an approach that would make sense for a lot of other platforms and organizations, though, and something we might be able to do in the future. Another thing to think about is charging a much higher rate for external partners while waiving fees for internal partners. Um, I think this is something that we're going to wind up doing anyway. In fact, we're required to sort of charge an extra layer on top of um, any fees for external partners. Um, but again, our goal here is to figure out how we can appropriately have transactions inside our university. So just waiving everything for our internal par partners is ultimately not the way we want to go for everything. And um, finally, subventions. In the university press world, there's a precedent of just having sort of a flat fee, asking the author to come up with $5,000 toward the cost of their book. And this is something we considered for the Michigan Publishing Services um, line of service. Um, but it turns out that, again, for internal transactions, we need to be able to be more granular about this. We can't just say, give us a pot of money. We have to be able to account exactly what it's for and what it's going for. Um, so this was not a solution for us either for this particular kind of service. Um, so in short, trying to move from a world of doing a lot of stuff for free to starting to charge is hard. We haven't even gotten to the part about um, trying to get our partners on board with this yet. We're still just dealing with the mechanics of it. It's taken a long time, and so far the results are really incremental and, and small. Um, so this is why, in part, in establishing this brand new thing, Michigan Publishing Services, um, we're doing it from the start with cost recovery as the goal and, and the requirement, really. Um, and you know, from what we've learned over the years, we now know that with Michigan Publishing Services, we want to be able to do a number of things that will be enabled by um, recovering our costs. We want to be able to scale up sustainably and quickly um, so that we don't get to a point where we're maxed out and we have to turn away projects. Um, if a new project comes on, it should come with the resources so that we can ramp up and, and do it. We want to be able to advertise our services and recruit new offerings clearly, so we need to be able to say concretely what we're able to do and how much it costs, um, rather than just responding to people coming to us. We want to be able to steward our university resources well, um, whether it's departmental funds, research funds, grants. Um, we can actually make more efficient use of it for our colleagues at the university um, by leveraging our vendor relationships and our existing skills. Um, they can get more bang for their buck if they come to us than if they go somewhere else, and so we want to make that possible. We want to cover our costs up front, or at least know how and when they'll be covered, rather than depending on sales to sort of backfill our investment in a product. And um, this gets back to sort of that $2,000 rush fee that I talked about before. We want to ask our campus partners to invest in and share the risk of taking on these projects. We're putting a lot of um, sort of in-kind support toward it, and we think that they should also be fully on board and invested and demonstrate that investment um, with you know, shared cost. Um, so what should we actually be doing? We've talked about some strategies that don't work. Um, in 2014, we've been trying to refine and implement a program that will work. And ultimately, it breaks down to uh, charging our publishing partners for our time and then directly passing on to the partners the expense of any third-party services. Um, so things that we go to other vendors for, we just push that cost back on them. Um, so this has been a really long and complex way of saying you've got to find out how much it costs, and then you have to ask for that much. Um, it sounds so simple, and yet it is not. Um, we're still working through making it happen, and Jason is going to talk us through how that works. So, yeah, we all agree that uh, recovering costs sounds like a good thing. The problem is figuring out what that actually means and how to do it. In a non-auxiliary environment like most library publishing programs, you just can't 
decide how much the market's going to bear and then charge that much. You have to follow the rules of your institution, which if you're at a public school like we are, are probably designed to prevent a publicly subsidized institution from out-competing private businesses. So that means doing a lot of legwork initially to analyze your costs and demonstrate fairness before you can start taking money systematically. Also, a lot of people who may not understand your work are going to have a lot of control over what and how you can charge for it. You might have to explain yourself to the library business office, which is relatively easy, central business office at the university, financial analysis officers, attorneys, development and grant officers, all kinds of people. You've probably never heard of your vendors. They may not even have heard of open access, library publishing at all. And at Michigan, these people are actually housed in their very own special tower off campus. Oh, wait. No, I think that's the wrong tower. There we go. OK. Sorry about that. So if you want to start recovering costs, it's important to have really realistic expectations, first of all, about the bureaucracy you're going to have to deal with. In a world that's used to instantaneous online payment, having to wait 30 days or more to even see an invoice sent out, let alone paid, can be really frustrating to people. Um, so you need to build that in. But the bureaucracy can work in your favor, too, if you know how to use it. If you work through a central finance office at your college or university, the first thing you're going to want to sort out uh, before you even try to charge anybody is probably the requirements they're going to put on you for invoicing and for accounts payable and receivable. So for instance, uh, do they require that all payable invoices be sent to them directly? Uh, ours does. So do those invoices have to include things like special email addresses so that they can contact you and authorize the invoice? Um, does that work with vendor systems? It probably won't. Um, so build in a few extra weeks and prepare to be annoyed. But there are advantages, too. Uh, for example, if you can outsource your accounts payable and accounts receivable to a central billing unit like we're starting to do, uh, those people will actually do your collections for you. So you send out an invoice to someone who owes you money, and then suddenly that money appears in your budget whether or not it gets paid. And the central finance people are really good at hounding people who owe you money, probably better than you are. So this helps your budget to keep moving instead of waiting for money to come in. Um, but that's just kind of anecdotal. Maybe the most powerful instrument we found at our disposal uh, through the university to help us recover our costs is the recharge rate. And I'm going to say this word like a million times. But first of all, at this point, this is where I transform from a librarian into an accountant. So, so what's a recharge rate? To put it simply, a recharge rate is a, a method of accounting that at our school and a lot of other public schools is required by federal regulations so to allow your unit to transfer the cost of staffing, uh, direct costs that you incur on behalf of other units at your institution or external partners to those units without having to have the salary directly paid. So you don't have to change reporting relationships. Um, it's a complicated instrument to use, but it's probably required. So I have some examples of what it kind of looks like when you're starting to put together a recharge rate, which uh, Rebecca and I have been doing quite a lot of lately. So there are two main ways you can calculate a recharge when you're working with your Office of Financial Analysis or whatever it might be called where you are. Uh, the first is to determine a, like, a fixed menu of services that you like to charge for, like copy editing coordination, typesetting, proofreading, web design, XML conversion, editing, whatever you've got. And then assign a, a per unit charge, like often per page or per book per chapter to these services. So if you choose this path, you're going to have to figure out what, on average, it costs to perform each given service for an average publication, then um, break it down further into different tiers of complexity, say light, medium, heavy copy edits. Um, this involves a lot of time measurement. So you'll need your staff member to measure his or her time spent on each task, um, and then extrapolate costs per page based on their salary. Um, this is possible to do. But it can be really hard, um, so hard that you'll want to just throw your hands and up and run away. And unfortunately, uh, running away from your responsibilities is not a billable service. So we chose another path, which we found out after talking with our Office of Financial Analysis for quite a while was an, an easier option, which is simply to build in hourly rates. So this is what we're doing. We've created a menu of services and analyzed the hourly rates of the staff members who perform these services and then slotted them in a sort of menu of services in this recharge rate. Um, this doesn't allow people you're working with to see an exact per page rate for their publication that they're going to get charged in advance, but they probably won't be looking at your recharge rate anyway. It's easy enough to just create an estimate based on your rates on a project by project basis once you've seen a draft. And most of the time, they're going to be happy as long as you're pretty close in your estimates. At least that's what we're finding. 
either way, we'll, whether it's a fixed menu or hourly rates, we'll pass muster with the folks in the tower. So once you've got your menu of services, you need to think about how recharge rates would affect your budget. If they work, this is where it gets kind of complicated, if it didn't already. Um, it functions something like a cross between a grant and a health savings account. When you make this recharge account that you'd be setting up, you have to allocate portions of your staff member's time to it, just like you would when you put a fixed dollar amount into an HSA at the beginning of the year. So you have to project how many hours each staff member is going to be spending each year doing recharge-related activities, and then divide that figure by the total number of hours they'll work per year to get a percentage of their FTE to assign to the recharge. It's kind of like a grant, but uh, the difference between a recharge and a grant, and this is where you can get into trouble, is that since your publishing partners are going to be paying into the recharge incrementally throughout the year, rather than all up front with the grant, uh, or in a few discrete chunks that you can anticipate, um, it's possible to get into a deficit if you overestimate how much work you're going to be doing. If you assign too much FDE to that recharge and then uh, you don't do that much work, like say you, haven't, you anticipate that a staff member who makes $50,000 a year is going to spend 20% of his time doing copy editing for recharge-related monographs, um, and thus $10,000 a year of his salary should be coming out of this recharge that you've designed, and then he only ends up uh, working on 10% of his time, you're in a $5,000 deficit. And at the end of the fiscal year, you've got to make up the difference by transferring funds from other accounts into the recharge account, or the controller is going to hound you down, get upset with you. And you have to stay within, at U of M, it's about 3%. It's, pretty, it's a pretty tight margin. You have to be pretty accurate. It's not the end of the world if you're off, but it does create a bit of an accounting headache. So you're probably thinking, this is really complicated. Why should I even think about doing this? Um, the obvious answer is you might have to. Um, you can probably get away with rebilling some activity with your institution with just simple fund transfers without anybody noticing, and that's fine. But as soon as a professor comes to you, like has happened to us, with a federal grant-funded project that they want to have a publication to go with, or gift funds, um, any kind of special funds that's, that are strictly monitored and have to observe federal guidelines, then you get into recharge land. And you just, we ran into this a few times before we had a recharge, we couldn't even claim the money from the people who wanted to give us money because we didn't have this complicated financial instrument to funnel it into. So that's what first spurred us to look into this or even to hear about it. But besides the, the whole regulatory thing, there are some intangible benefits too. Um, to me, the number one thing that you get with the recharge that's a bonus is it's, it's a tool to demonstrate something close to the true cost of the publishing activity that you're doing. So when the dean comes to you and asks you, why does it cost $5,000 to copy edit and typeset this book for my faculty member? You can break down those costs, not just with your external vendors, but internal staff too, a lot more accurately than you could if you hadn't done the work up front to set up the recharge. And then you can say, all these costs have been reviewed by all the proper finance folks in the tower, and it's really hard to argue with that. So tracking time. Um, you're going to have to track time if you want to do this. And you want to do it in a way so that everybody doesn't start to hate you. Um, at Michigan Publishing, we've tried a couple of different methods, and we hope we've settled on one that uh, staff don't totally hate. First thing we did, though, they did totally hate. We tried a Google Doc where folks were recording how much time they spent on different tasks, and this is a sample from last November. Um, so they'd go into the Google Sheet, and they would enter their name and the ISBN or ISSN, the thing they're working on. It auto populate a few things. They'd mark from 16 different kinds of tasks they were doing that lined up with the recharge rates, et cetera, and how much time they'd spent. This really didn't work out very well because um, having to recreate this Google Doc on a monthly basis turned out to be a real pain, and it was a good opportunity to have all the formulas mess up. And uh, there was no good way to automatically populate project names, and people just got really cranky about it. So uh, Jeremy Morse and I uh, started to investigate something new. This is a, a paid web app. It's not too bad. It's not too expensive. Called Toggle. It's a much nicer experience. You can set up teams and assign projects to them and have people either record their elapsed time working with a timer, or they can go in later and enter an estimate of how much time they spent. It'll give you a nice CSV export or um, predetermined reports at the end of the month, so you can um, give those to your business office, and then they can do all the billing for you. It's not perfect, but people really do seem to prefer it to the Google Sheet thing that we were doing before. And there are other time tracking services out there, and you should do your own due diligence and figure out what works well for you. But uh, regardless of how you do it, make sure to keep your increments humane. That was another thing we found out. Um, having folks report things every hour or every half hour what they're working on, 
they'll put up with that. But if you ask your staff to report what they're doing every five minutes, you might not have a staff anymore. So those are some tools that we've been doing. Um, but where are we right now? These are our goals for our first year. We'd like to recover about 25% of the student labor that we pay for and 100% of our direct vendor costs, which are easy because it's just a pass-through of an invoice. Um, we'd like to recover about 30% in the first year of our digital publishing coordinator, 10% uh, of my salary, 10% of our print services manager, and then small bits of a, a front-end web designer and an accountant. That's just in the first year. We anticipate that as more projects come in, these percentages will keep going up until if we hit 100%, say, on the digital publishing coordinator, we'll hire another one. Um, and the rest of our operating costs will continue to be subsidized by the library or generated from product sales and hosting revenue, like Rebecca mentioned a few minutes ago. So our current plan is just is to scale up slowly. As recharge activity grows, we'll add student and temporary staff until we hit a threshold where it makes sense to hire a full-time person. And hopefully uh, that'll be a successful model for us. Now back to you for a few other things. Oops. Okay, so um, we've talked through some really nitty-gritty stuff here. Uh, to sort of wrap up, we want to return to the big picture a minute for a minute. We want to just sort of leave you with two big ideas. Um, the first one is that clearly functioning in a nonprofit and possibly a publicly funded environment, setting prices and charging fees for your work may be really complicated and it may take a lot longer than anyone would think is reasonable. Um, so just our, our warning is to be prepared to expect that sort of going in um, and to sort of perhaps in advance um, Think about who the people at your institution would be that would be involved and seek them out. Seek their guidance. Um, be prepared to explain yourself again and again and sort of find out what the requirements are. Um, in our case, we found out a lot of them sort of in a very backwards way. We tried to bill somebody and then the finance office came back and said, you can't do this. It's not allowed. You have to go back and, you know, do not pass go. Do not collect $2,000. Start over um, with this whole process. So we hope that you might not have to go through this painful learning experience, um, by sort of proactively discovering what your rules and regulations might be and who all the people are, people you've never met on your campus who, who are going to have something to say about this. Second idea to sort of leave you with is that, um, cost recovery sounds like a very sort of factual, numerical, objective thing. You have some number and you're trying to get to that number. Um, but it's really not. Um, what it even means to recover costs will depend on the rules at your organization and how your operation fits into it. Does cost recovery include equipment, space, um, overhead? You know, that it will be different from place to place. Um, and what the expectations are and what the requirements are, are they'll be different. Um, but you'll need to find out what they are and, and think about them. Um, our aim really is to think about what the story of library publishing is at your institution. Um, what are you trying to do? What's your mission? And then building business models that are aligned with it. Um, so the way you talk about your work should be reflected in the way you charge for your work or don't. Um, it's perfectly acceptable if you can not to charge. That's also fine. Um, it's just a matter of what, you're, what you need to do and, and what you want to do, what your ambitions are. So because of these sort of complexities. We don't have an easy recipe for you, um, though we hope that you might be able to avoid some of the pitfalls we've experienced. Um, we'd be happy to keep in touch or speak with you individually about what you're working on, and we also look forward to reporting back in a year or two and seeing sort of how this has all played out. Um, we're hopeful that, that it will work. Um, but we'd be happy to discuss or take your questions at this point. Um, it's just about three, so we've got 15 minutes, plenty of time. <laughs>